Welcome everyone to my online course for research methods in psychology. My name is Frank Lociavo and I am your instructor. I have a few interesting things to discuss with you, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In the last video, I introduced four key validities, internal, external, statistical, and construct. In this video, I'll discuss how we can ask several targeted questions to assess or interrogate the validity of a frequency claim. Along the way, we'll assess a frequency claim's external validity, statistical validity, and construct validity. As you'll see in a future video, internal validity applies to causal claims only. In other words, internal validity does not apply to frequency claims, and frequency claims are the subject of this video. All right, let's get to work. Before we get too deep into the woods, here's a reminder of the four validities, with brief descriptions of each. If necessary, feel free to pause the video so you can review them. Previously, I suggested that it's wise to commit these four types of validity to memory. And I mentioned that I tend to remember them in this order, internal-external, statistical construct. Those first letters spell out I-E-S-C, which for some strange reason I find helpful. I think that's because it's easy to remember internal and external, that's I and E, and from there you remember the letters S-C, which prompts your brain to recall statistical and construct validities. So in my mind, when I think about the four key validities, I always think I-E-S-C. That's I-E-S-C, I-E-S-C. All right, let's go ahead and discuss how to interrogate frequency claims. You might recall that frequency claims describe a level or a rate or some degree of one single individual variable. One single individual variable. Remember, that's the key feature that distinguishes frequency claims from association claims and causal claims. In a previous video, I provided this headline as an example of a frequency claim. 39% of teens admit to texting while driving. That's a claim based on one single individual variable. And obviously, the claim tells us the rate of texting among teens. Frequency claims typically come from surveys or polls. And my impression is that this claim is based on some sort of survey. We'll try to find that out in a minute. So let's assess the overall validity of this frequency claim by assessing each of the key validities we discussed previously. Let's start at the top of this table with construct validity. We'd ask ourselves, how well have the researchers measured the variable in question? The claim provides the percentage of teens who admit to texting while driving. So we need to figure out what specific variable was measured. Clearly, teens were asked if they text and drive, and the responses represent the data for this variable. But without more information, we don't know exactly what question the researchers asked. For example, they might have asked a simple yes-no question, such as, do you text and drive? From those responses, we could calculate the percentage of respondents who text and drive. But maybe they asked, how often do you text and drive, or some other question, and then they analyzed the data from there. If we're going to figure out how well the researchers measured this variable, we're going to need more information about this research study. So, let's Google it. From my web browser, I simply googled the headline, and I know the headline was based on research by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, so I put the letters CDC in front of the headline, and then I hit search. This first hit took me to a CDC web page focused on distracted driving. I scrolled down a bit, and I found the claim we've been looking for. The webpage says the claim is from a 2019 survey of U.S. high school students. At the bottom of the page, I found a few references with links to the original research study. That's exactly what we wanted. The research study is known as the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And now that we have access to the actual research report, we should be able to find quite a bit of information to help us assess key validities. To assess construct validity, we need to know how well the researchers measured the variable in question. As I scrolled down, I found the method section, 
and a subsection that describes the measurements the researchers collected. In that subsection, I found exactly what we were looking for. It says that texting while driving was assessed with the question, during the past 30 days, how many days did you text or email while driving a car or other vehicle? So instead of simply asking a yes-no question, the researchers assessed how many days the teens texted or emailed during the past 30 days. To me, that seems like an appropriate, reasonable way to measure the rate of texting and driving. It's very straightforward. It makes sense. In other words, it seems valid. Furthermore, it states that students who had not driven a car during the past 30 days were excluded from the analysis. Again, that makes sense. That's reasonable. That's appropriate. And then finally, we can get a better sense of where that percentage came from. It says that responses among drivers were categorized as zero times or days versus greater than or equal to one time or day. That means that teens' responses were coded as either zero, meaning they did not text and drive during the past 30 days, or their responses were coded as greater than or equal to one, meaning they did text and drive one or more times during the past 30 days. Based on that detailed information, I can now see that 39% of the respondents admitted that they did indeed text and drive one or more times during the past 30 days. That's a lot of good information that we just discovered about this claim. And based on all that information, I'm going to conclude that the construct validity of this claim is good. In other words, the target variable was measured appropriately. Next, let's assess the statistical validity of this claim. To assess the statistical validity of this percentage, 39%, it would be helpful to know the margin of error associated with that 39% estimate. You might not have thought about sample statistics for a while, but that's exactly what they are. They're typically point estimates. Using sample data, sample statistics, like 39%, estimate population parameters. A margin of error, or a confidence interval, will help us know how close that sample statistic, 39%, is to the real population value, the real answer, which we call a population parameter. So I scrolled down through the research report until I found the results section. That's where the authors formally reported that 39% of the teens admitted to texting while driving. Hoping to find some additional information, I clicked on this link for Table 1. As you can see, Table 1 did not disappoint. In this highlighted section, I see the 39% sample statistic, which is a point estimate, but I also see a 95% confidence interval reported. You can see it ranges from a low value of 36.4% to a high value of 41.7%. Let me refresh your memory from your statistics class. The confidence interval is telling us that there's a 95% chance that the true population percentage of teens texting and driving during that 30-day period is somewhere between 36.4% and 41.7%. That's a relatively tight or narrow confidence interval, and that's good. That means it's relatively precise. Think about it. A confidence interval that ranged from 9% to 69% wouldn't be very helpful because the range would be so wide, but this interval is relatively tight so it helps us get a good sense of what the true population percentage really is. There's a 95% chance that it falls somewhere between 36.4% and 41.7%. So, just to summarize, in my notes, I listed the sample percentage, 39%, which I labeled P hat. That's what we call the P with a funny little hat on it. And I also listed the 95% confidence interval using a standard, acceptable format. Overall, the statistical validity of this frequency claim seems good. It seems reasonable. I don't have any major concerns at this point. We don't need to worry about internal validity for this frequency claim because frequency claims don't typically mention causality. For example, this frequency claim didn't make the case that peer pressure causes texting and driving. For the most part, we only need to worry about internal validity when causal claims are made. So, let's move on. External validity is often known as generalizability. Both terms focus on the same basic issue. When assessing external validity, 
we typically try to find out how the sample was selected. Were the respondents selected based on some random type of sampling procedure? Is it likely that the sample represents a larger population of interest? In other words, can we generalize these results to something larger than the sample that was surveyed? Americans typically focus on the USA, so when a survey results in a frequency claim like this one, we typically want to know if the results can be generalized or applied to the U.S. population, in this case, the U.S. teen population. So let's go back to the research report and see what details we can discover about the sample of teens the researchers studied. I scrolled through the report and revisited the method section where I found a subsection that discussed the source of the data. The report states that the CDC collects data from a nationally representative sample of students in grades 9 through 12 in each of the 50 states. In a frequently asked questions portion of the website, I found this additional information, which essentially states that students are randomly selected to participate. That's good news. Random samples from all across the country are likely to produce data that represents the country very well. In other words, this frequency claim that 39% of teens admit to texting while driving is likely to represent the population of American teens in grades 9 through 12. So, generally speaking, the external validity of this frequency claim seems good. The methods the researchers used to select their teen sample were appropriate. So far, so good. But remember, no research study is perfect. You can probably think of a few potential criticisms, and you know, the authors can as well. In fact, at the bottom of their research report, there's a section that discusses the study's limitations. And at the very bottom, there's contact information for the person we call the corresponding author. That's simply the author of the four authors who is available and willing to discuss the study in case someone might have questions or comments. Over the years, I've contacted many authors, typically to thank them for their excellent work and often to ask a follow-up question. Back to our frequency claim. Overall, I give it a big thumbs up. The construct validity, the statistical validity, and the external validity are all very good. So I believe we can trust this claim. I think it tells us something important about 9th to 12th grade teen drivers in the USA. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because I'll have more to say about research methods in the next video.